Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with a short introduction. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Minnesota Roadway and Maintenance Demo Day virtual series. The Minnesota Roadway Maintenance Training and Demo Day is sponsored by Minnesota LTAP, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, Minnesota Lo Local Road Research Board, and the Federal Highway Administration in partnership with the American Public Works Association and the Minnesota Chapter and Minnesota Street Superintendents Association. LTAP is a program designed to provide local transportation agencies with the tools for improving operations. LTAP's ultimate goal is to foster a safe, efficient, environmentally sound transportation system by improving skills and knowledge of local transportation providers through training, events, demonstrations, technical assistance, and technology transfer. Minnesota LTAP provides multiple training opportunities throughout the year, including annual events, technical workshops, and self-paced online courses. You can visit our training and events calendar on our website for all upcoming opportunities. LTAP has a variety of newsletters, reference documents, videos, a website, and provides library services and technical document searches. LTAP supports local agency innovations through two programs, Build a Better Mousetrap and Operational Research Assistance Program. Mousetrap is a state and national competition. Your entry can be anything from the development of tools or gadgets to equipment modifications, to processes that increase safety, improve efficiency, reduce costs, or improve the quality of transportation. The purpose of this competition is to collect and disseminate real-world examples of best practices, tips from the field, and assist in the transfer of technology. We would just like to recognize and congratulate our 2020 Rhodes Scholar graduates. And then before I think turn things over to our instructors today, I just wanted to briefly go over Zoom features. So we'll ask this morning that you remain on mute while the presenters are talking. Video is completely optional. And if you can use the chat box for questions, I believe John and Nick will be taking questions at the end. So please put them in there and I'll be following that. And if you have any technical difficulties, please contact me through chat. And now I'll turn things over to Nick and John. Uh, thanks, Claire. Uh, my name is John Lenander. I'm an engineer with the city of Fridley. And with me is Nick Elski, uh, one of our engineering technicians. We're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about our experience with bringing uh, drone operations to Public Works Department of the city of Fridley. Uh, Fridley entered the world of drone operations with the addition of Nick to our staff, who's a licensed drone pilot. Uh, this opens several possibilities for us to enhance and expand our public works operations. Um, our presentation will cover how Fridley is using the drone, uh, the obstacles and unforeseen complications we've run into, and how we see the expansion of drone flights to help us see things differently and increase our efficiency. Uh, we're planning for time at the end to ask questions. And we'll post our contact information. So if you'd like to talk further after the presentation, um, please do that. We're happy to talk with you. So Fridley has been watching drone technology, or at least I have for uh, years, uh, but we've never really bought into it. We've had consultants use it on project, use them on projects. We've had developers um, use them a part, as a part of the projects they've brought into the city. And we've had uh, uh, employees who own, privately own drones who have offered to bring drones in and use them as part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but we've never really done that. So in 2019, a longtime employee retired and we hired his replacement, who is Nick. Now, Nick's an enthusiast, he's active in drones. He builds them, he flies them, and he follows the technology. And at the same time, uh, we had available equipment capital, and I was given the go-ahead to buy a drone and develop a program. Uh, what we did is we started off talking with others who are already using drones. In particular, uh, Joe Campbell with the Federal Highway Administration was incredibly helpful with us, got us going in the right direction, saved us a bunch of time. Uh, we bought a drone and started to fly. Uh, now, it's not really quite that simple um, to start off with. You know, what drone do you buy? Uh, you know, they, they range from 
a few hundred dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and you need to determine what drone is going to do what you need it to do. Uh, the federal regulations you need to be aware of. Uh, the the uh, FAA uh, regulates the sky, and you need to have a pilot's license for what we do. Um, so you need to have somebody that's aware of what those regulations are. The state regulations, now MnDOT's the regulatory authority for drones in Minnesota, you need to know what their rules are. Uh, permits, you need to register the drone. Now that's uh, one rule that's, that's changing since we bought our drone, and that's going to continue to become uh, more important so that they can determine you know, what drones are in the sky and which ones are flying and how to keep track of them. Uh, local rules. Uh, now, some cities have have or, uh, drone ordinances. City of Fridley does not. We may at some point. But if you're flying close to another city, they may have one. Now, in particular, in Fridley, we do have the Mississippi River, which is a part of the national park system. And the national park system does have restrictions on drone flights. So you need to be, need to be aware of what else is out there. Um, and then city policy. Um, before we even received our drone, uh, we had to put together a policy of how in engineering or at least in public works, we were going to use the drone. Uh, and we did that. So we had a draft policy before we received the drone. Um, after we had that in place, the, our city manager uh, felt it was important that uh, they have an umbrella policy that covers because other departments are interested in drones as well. So um, they, uh, uh, they, they've, they've, we have a draft umbrella policy and we have a draft engineering policy and I think other departments are working on theirs as well. Um, so how is Fridley using the drone? Um, I guess number one is, is for taking pictures. I think that's probably the most common use that uh, um, people use drones for. They, they have great cameras in them. They take great pictures and, and by being able to fly at different places, you can get a different view of things. Uh, video records. Uh, we, Nick will have an ex, have a, a example of how we've used uh, video uh, records of following different projects and before and after. Um, mapping and design. The city has a number of small sites that we've been working on uh, that we don't have current survey information for. So within a very little time, Nick can go out and fly it, process it, and then we'll have a scalable, accurate um, you know, map that we can start preliminary design from. Um, volume of stockpiles. We've, we've run into a number of situations where we've had a stockpile. We really didn't know how much material was in it. We needed to know. Nick can fly them and fairly quickly give us a, a pretty, pretty good uh, um, estimate of what the, what the volumes in those stockpiles are. Um, inspections, we've also been using it for doing inspections. We've got a number of uh, fairly large uh, development projects going on in Fridley right now. Um, and we've started where we'll fly the whole site once a week and then use that to uh, kind of look for areas that we have to go back and look at closer. And then the last is cooperation with other departments. Um, Almost every other department at the city, once they found out we had the drone and that we had a pilot, you know, had interest, they have things that they would want it for. So, you know, we, we've been willing to do that as well. Um, from my standpoint, uh, the more you use the drone, the more you're able to imagine what the other possibilities are. And like it or not, drones are going to change things. So with that, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Nick and he'll tell you a little bit more about our drone and the way that, you know, specifically how we're using it. Okay, thanks, John. Um... Like John said, my name is Nick Oski. So I've been an engineering tech for 10 years now, and um, I've been interested in drones for about seven of those years. So I got I kind of get, got my interest um, from a MinDOT technical conference where they went over some of the survey and the uh, design uh, uses for drones. So obviously that relating so much to my career, that's kind of what sparked my interest. And then since then, I've kind of picked up on the hobbyist style, um, first person view drones, uh, building and flying those personally. So um, so this is the drone that we decided to buy, the Mavic Pro 2 Zoom drone. So everything you'll see in this presentation is done with that one. That's the only one we've got. Nick, so sorry, decided... to, Nick sorry to interrupt you, but the, the presentation is not on the screen right now. Oh, it's not? Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Is it on now? No, if you, so did you click share screen? Yep. Okay, share screen and then click on the tab. There you go. Okay, nice. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Um, yeah, so this one was made by DJI. It's the Mavic Pro 2 Zoom drone. So the thing about um, DJI is that um, they have a really good, they're really good at the autonomous flight part of the, um, of, the, of the drone. So they have a waypoint navigation and a mapping mission that you can execute right out of the box. So that was a big reason why we chose it. Um, originally, we started with uh, structural inspection and inspections of, of these um, of, of, these, of these construction sites going on and Gridley as the primary use. So we chose this one because it has a two times optical zoom and, um, and, and a, a battery life about 30 minutes and with uh, those automated flight features. So um, the negatives of this drone, um, probably already that it's too much of a generalized one. So they already have like a Mavic Air 2 that's smaller um, that we could use that we feel like would be better in residential areas that doesn't, uh, have as much of a kind of a footprint on, or it's not as noticeable for residents. So that's one of our main concerns now is that our residents will feel like they're being spied on when we're flying our drones. So sm the smaller, the better for that. And then maybe a bigger drone for mapping that you can see for further distances. So, cause, with, cause you, even though you can, um, so basically you can, you have to fly a visual line of sight so you can only fly as far as you can see the drone. And this one's actually pretty small too. So that's sometimes a hindrance, but. And uh, already there's uh, a lot of other drones out there that are, that are better than this one. So. so I'll kind of go through some of these general, uh, some general stuff, and then I'll get into some case studies uh, later and some things that we've been doing. So for kind of general stuff, so the uh, pilot requirements so to, to, uh, to fly a drone commercially, which is, at any, which is a flight that, um, that somebody makes money with, even if you ha get handed off to somebody for free, and then they post it on their website, that would still be com uh, considered a commercial flight. But to do that, you have to have uh, your remote pilot certificate. And um, to get that, uh, you have to uh, learn the rules. So there's basic rules, which is just a long list that the FAA has of, of rules. You have to look it up. Um, I don't want to go over all of them. But I know the two most restrictive ones that I deal with day to day flying the drone is the visual line of sight rule having to see it everywhere because that that's actually harder than what it seems. Because if you're on the ground, even some trees can, a uh, couple of trees can get in your way and be restrictive for, for mapping and that type of thing when you're trying to cover large sites. And then uh, flying over people, you can't fly over people. So, which is changing with the new rule, but I'll talk about that. But um, currently, if you're not uh, following any of the categorizations with the new rule, uh, you still can't fly over people. So, and that includes um, people on like, walk on bike trails and stuff because we do have a lot of bike trails and uh, sidewalks and that kind of thing and then over highways too so so those are both those two together are pretty are them are the, probably the most restrictive um that we that we have and then new rules i really am talking about kind of their new opportunities that uh the faa is uh, allowing for us but along with that comes the new rules so like the flying over people thing now now you can but your your drone has to fit into one of three categories that they lay out so but once you learn the rules, then you need to take the knowledge test. So that's a 30 or 40 minute test that um, is administered by the FAA. So um, you just go online to, their, to the FAA website and then you can find your way to signing up on there. And then once you do that, um, you get to pick out the drone, uh, probably one of the fun parts, uh, and really try to get one that's tailored for uh, a few individual things that you really uh, for sure want to do. And then maybe you can grow it from there. That's kind of the way that we went. But then after that, then you can register your drone and that's with the FAA. And so that's like a $5 charge for three years. And then if you live in the state of Minnesota, you'll have to license it with the, the state of Minnesota too. And then uh, check into any local municipality rules as well. So pilot responsibilities. So um, follow all local and federal laws. So I was just at another presentation with, about law enforcement and um, they're talking about uh, local law enforcement really trying to enforce the, their existing rules with harassment and privacy and that type of thing. 
to um, just two of these drones as if it were a person holding a camera. Since the FAA is really the one, the regulatory authority on the airspace itself. So the FAA deals with uh, where you can fly and where you can't fly. And um, what happens if you see another airplane who yields the right of way, that type of thing. So um, just kind of following all local and federal laws. And this is by no means all pilot responsibilities, but just a few of them that kind of stuck out to me. Uh, aeronautical decision-making, I think that's kind of a broad term that FAA uses um, to make sure that you're using good decisions and to hold you accountable if you're not. So it's, it's really out there for people to, if you say, take your, take your drone up with half a battery and you don't realize it, and then it falls out of the sky and hits somebody, um, that's making uh, bad aeronautical decision-making, which is, um, which you can be held accountable for from the FAA. So um, they have charts and stuff on how you make decisions and there's actually a big uh, process to it. But that's kind of the catch all, I think. Uh, it's hard to get specific rules, I think the FAA, for the FAA, so they have kind of this broad term. And then they have, uh, I just put uh, apply crew resource management on there, which is another interesting term that the FAA uses. So that's really everything that goes along with the mission. And, um, when they talk about crew resource management, that's really with all of aviation. So um, it's an aviation term. So really you, uh, the transmitter itself would be uh, part of it and the receiver for the, for the drone. And then uh, maybe walkie talkies if you're using that or binoculars, although binoculars won't satisfy the visual line of sight rule. Um, and I also have on there visual observer. So, which is a person that's dedicated to, um, watching the drone in the sky. So if you're doing a mission and you're looking at your iPad the whole time, then uh, you need to have a visual observer. So crew resource management is just making sure you have all the tools to safely perform your mission. So mission planning. So safety is obviously the most important thing. So I don't think anybody would wanna be the, the guy in the picture up there. So um, that those props are really sharp and like have been known to take fingers off. Uh, cause they just spin really fast. Um, the sharpness is kind of crazy, but also they're, um, having that fall out of the sky and maybe reach a hundred miles an hour is still a lot of, um, force. So that could kill somebody too, if you're not careful. So it's a really important thing. Um, I always, before I, before I take off, I, I always, um, check the site and know where the safest place to bring, bring the, the aircraft down is, cause that's really what you're talking about with a lot of the safety stuff is, if a prop uh, breaks or something in the air, a bird attacks it, you just wanna get it down as fast as possible. So airspace, NOTAMs and FAA regulations. So airspace, um, so uh, the FAA has a cap on all of, uh, on, on the highest you can go with the drone and that's about 400 feet. That is 400 feet. And, and, and there's, a couple, there's a couple exceptions around buildings and stuff you can go higher. But uh, if you're flying below 400 feet, uh, Mostly all they have to worry about is class D airspace, which is airspace within five miles of an airport. So uh, I, have on, I have on the bottom left, that's what that picture is. So that's, that's a, um, an app that's registered with the Lance system. So in order to fly in these class D airspaces, you have to submit a, submit a, um, a form to get authorization before you can take off in, in those areas. And so since, uh, the FAA was being flooded with this earlier, uh, maybe like three, four, three or four years ago, they came up with this automated system where if you're flying below a certain feet, you can automatically get um, permission to go and fly there. So NOTAMs, that's notice to, air, to airmen. And so that's um, just kind of temporary things. Um, maybe I think the, like the president's flying overhead or if it's, a, um, if there's like a state, if there's like a sports event going on, but I think those are actually called temporary flight restrictions too, but knowing those and then other FAA regulations. And then I would say uh, get a good weather app and know what's gonna go on with the weather. So if things do get close, you really can, uh, you really know, you can, you can check it and really know like where the rain is or what the wind speed is and that type of thing. So we also have kind of set constraints for our drone and um, when we'll fly. So we don't fly below 32 degrees. So we, we are gonna, we're kind of working with the police department and we've decided during emergencies, we'll go as low as 20. Um, and that's kind of in, in regards to the battery too, we wanna make sure the batteries stay warm. So 
that's kind of tied with it. But, but wind, we don't uh, fly under 20. We reschedule if it's uh, 15 or higher. So, um, and then the emergency procedures, uh, that's the kind of like what I talked about in the safety thing, uh, just always knowing what you're gonna do in case of emergency. And then um, crew, crew resource management, making sure you have all the tools for the job. So I use this um, this flight log. This is a great this was a great this is a great tool for me to use because it actually does three things. It satisfies the um, our maintenance checklist too. So we do a maintenance check before every flight, which the FAA requires in all of aviation. So even though a drone isn't um, you can't necessarily you're not going to open up the body and inspect the electrical components. You can still uh, spin the motors and check the props and see if there's dust in the motors. You can kind of hear grinding and stuff like that. And then what we do is we take off and then we hover at a low, a low altitude and just kind of watch it and make sure that it's uh, nothing awkward is happening and that it's stable. So it does that. And then it, there's a pre-flight you have to do too with um, in all of aviation. So that includes drones. And so this is our pre-flight checklist that we that, that satisfies that too. And it kind of, it asks a couple of things like wind, temperature, um, visibility, if you have your three miles, because you need three miles visibility as well. And so it's also just a good tool to help you remember. Um, it also, there's like SD, is there an SD card inserted? And so it's just my big um, catch all list, basically. So I do this before I fly. And then um, I obtain authorization to fly in controlled airspace. And since we're in the, in, in the metro area, we're in uh, class D airspace uh, most of the time. So we plan on doing that every time. And then do a safety inspection of the site just to uh, know where the hazards are, where the people are basically. So, so post-processing. So this is, um, post-processing can really be any, any editing that you do to the raw data uh, once you bring it in. So that's even, I think everybody kind of knows about basic uh, editing of photos, how you can put text over it and videos and that type of thing. But what I'm going to be talking about mostly when I talk about post-processing is really like these kind of three-dimensional models and two-dimensional ortho mosaics. So that, that was the reason why, um, like I mentioned earlier, why I kind of got interested in, in drones that, to, to start with. Just, uh, just wondering if some of this stuff could be used uh, in conjunction with our surveying and design and that type of thing. So talking about the products, so um, that image of the stockpile, and I'll talk more about that later, your stockpile measurement project. But we, what we use is uh, Open Drone Map, which is, um, it's a, which is an open source software um, that you can find online. And the benefit of using that is that it's free. So um, there's, there's other softwares, like I think Pix4D is probably the most important one that um, you guys would be familiar with too, probably. Um, that's more of kind of like a one button software, which there's still a lot of, a lot of stuff you have to learn before you can um, start spitting out models like this. But uh, the, the open drone map just requires a lot of research to get that up and running and working. And so for like elements, like um, <clears throat> what, you put in, what you put into these softwares is um, a series of downward facing images. So when I talked about the DJI software coming out of the box with, um, with the um, mapping, the, the intelligent flight mapping. So you can just go into the app and you drag a rectangle and, it, and it'll actually, you tell it the overlap, how much overlap in each picture you want. And it'll actually plan out the flight map for you. And then it, you just tell it to go and it'll go and uh, autonomously fly that mission. So basically at any, at any given point, you'll have seven, seven or nine, something like that uh, points all, um, or pictures all, all all, uh, of the same point. And so then the software knows where the drone was at uh, at that time where it took the picture. And then it kind of has an X and Y where the pixel is within the picture. And then using that, it can tri use trigonometry to figure out uh, three-dimensional points kind of, which is what is being shown as that model. Uh, accuracy, so it's important to know like the accuracy of the setup you have. So you can get into um, units with like RTK or just um, corrected, GPS values that'll give you a lot more accurate, well, that will give you more accuracy. But for our setup that we have, we've been having really good luck horizontally. So we've been getting within like anywhere from probably like 500 to uh, 1400 um, is kind of like how far our checkpoints have been off. 
when we've been checking our horizontal accuracy. And then vertical accuracy, we're still working on getting something usable out of that. So um, we're kind of having some lensing issues we're working through, but um, that's been, we're hoping to get within about half a foot to a foot accuracy for that. Which we're hoping is would, might be okay for some type of some grading jobs, you know, if you're also supplementing that with other data. So, and then equipment software, I'd recommend getting a, a dedicated computer for this. So, um, these pro processing this can take somewhere anywhere between like two to maybe six hours, and um, it's not as easy as just processing at once. So what we found is that we're processing it over and over again. We kind of make some changes in some settings to try to get um, our control points to line up better to get gain accuracy. So um, it's usually, we usually don't get it on the first one. So you can imagine how much time that takes. So you process it once and then you look at it for five minutes and realize you wanna make a change and then you gotta process it again. So that can be a pretty drawn out process. So then getting into our kind of our case studies. So this was an interesting one. So these first two are really easy ones that maybe if you're looking at starting a drone program, um, you can kind of just justify it just on this, this kind of stuff alone. So this was a radio antenna inspection. So that our, um, so this is at a water treatment plant right? and um, how, how our system works is that there's radio antenna on top of this water tower and that sends a signal directly to uh, our public works facility and um, about the status of the water treatment plant. And so when that signal goes down, um, then they get an emergency broadcast or an emergency notification and it has to be investigated, obviously, because it's important we're a city, we provide water to the entire city. So um, they somehow figured out there was a problem with the, with the link in the antenna that was causing these um, emergency notifications. And so uh, what they did, the operations uh, superintendent uh, came to me and asked if we could go up there and fly, maybe zoom, zoom into like some of the components of the antenna and figure out what was going on with it. So uh, we went out there and took off and went kind of straight up into the air and it really didn't take any um, flight skills. They just go straight up and then we could just angle it over to the antenna and we saw right away all these cellular um, antennas. And <clears throat> so we did do some zooming in on the antenna and things like that. But at the end of the day, it ended up being the obstruction was just that these um, cellular antennas were in the way. And that's what we determined to cause the, the uh, obstruction. So. Um, instead of having instead of having a consultant come out and climb up there and look at it, uh, we were able to just send him this picture right here, and this just told the whole story for him. So, so then he only had to come out once, basically, uh, to make the repairs, and he, he knew what tools he had to get and that kind of thing. So, planning this was in the class D airspace, so it was really easy. Um, just send the the lance the lance notification, and the flight. There was an interesting thing about this flight, so. With the water tower, um, I was really uh, nervous about accidentally putting the drone on the other side of the water tower because uh, our drone set to return to home and the watt and all that metal and water in there, I would assume would break their radio signal. So that was just kind of one of the main concerns on it is that I just never did that. Because then uh, if it returned to home, obviously it would fly directly through the water tower, which would result in a crash. So. So lessons learned, uh, we actually got out there and there was three of us out there and the, the software needed updating. That was the first thing. So um, we sat there for like 20 minutes uh, while we waited for the software to update. So just making sure my software was up to date if uh, there's multiple people or if it's, there's a meeting or something like that. So here's the other really simple one. So this was just a cool picture. Um, our parks department was um, trying to promote our parks a little bit more. And this is an ongoing thing to have me, um, to have me kind of snap pictures like this, like if I'm ever in the area. So if I'm flying uh, a mission for something else and I'm near a park, I can either, I can either include it in the mission uh, that I just fly over there, or I just can put it down and go drive over there and take a picture if it's a nice day. So things like this are really easy and they only take uh, a couple of minutes. So there wasn't really any planning involved with that. So uh, just class D airspace again. And then uh, the flight itself uh, was easy. It was another straight up and down flight. So that was my point with these is it was straight up and down. It's really easy to do. So you can, you can kind of, cause I know a lot of people are scared to use the control it and fly it, but 
Um, you can kind of mitigate that with easy flights too. You don't need to like go and do the autonomous stuff right away or go fly around uh, manually. So um, lessons learned. So I actually took off from this parking lot over here, the community center parking lot. And then um, I went up and I wasn't, wasn't getting the frame I wanted. And I was thinking just about flying over across the highway, but, uh, and trying to look and see when, when cars were coming. But then I realized I kind of sat up there for a minute and thought about it. And then before I did, then I realized I could have just brought it down and I moved to this parking lot over here, um, directly below where this picture was taken from. And then I just flew it straight up again. So in the city, it's hard to, you know, be, to stay away from pedestrians and stuff, but, uh, just a straight up flight. A lot of times will get you what you, what you want. So Lesson learned is just kind of like always being safety. You want like a little bit of a, um, just in case it falls down, just in case there is a prop or an engine failure or something like that. If you always put yourself in a safe situation, the odds of you uh, being involved in an accident are uh, incredibly low. So. so moving on to more complex projects. So this was the Lower Rice Creek Stabilization Project. It was done by Rice Creek Watershed District in conjunction with the city of Fridley. So this one I utilized, um, the um, autonomous flight, the waypoint navigation. And uh, it began actually as a mapping mission, uh, but we didn't really know what we were gonna get out of it, but um, we just wanted to record kind of before and after something to kind of um, show the change. So um, you can actually watch the video on YouTube if you go there and um, just type lower rice peak stabilization project is on there. But um, for this presentation, I decided just to keep it do some snip, some snips of the of the video, just to keep it kind of easy and short. But yeah, so we decided to um, at the beginning just fly this and then kind of see what we would end up with at the end and see where the sites were because we didn't even know exactly where all the sites were. So we flew the flight um, starting here and ending over here, and then each one of these red dots ended up being where the where the uh, the the construction sites were. The it was really stream bank mitigation type stuff, so rip rap and and berms and that kind of thing. So here's the one of the first snips of it. So um, we ended up taking the before and the after and we made a video and we just um, pasted them together. And the cool thing was with the waypoint navigation is that the timing of the video actually lined up exactly. So we didn't have to stretch the video um, at all. So it was really easy for our um, videographer to put this together. Um, so yeah, and then in the upper left there, you see the flight, the the flight map, or the so that that actually DJI records that in their app, and so I was able to screen record that, and then I pasted that in the upper left and had it before and after, so you kind of knew where you were. So it turned out pretty good. Um, so here's yeah, here's some pretty cool, a pretty cool uh, rip wrap stretch there. This is kind of the same thing. So the planning of this one, this was an interesting one. So I'll actually just go back a couple of slides. So this is actually where I took off from. Um, so this is the public works building. So I climbed up to the top of that and that's how I was able to see across all these trees. So it was pretty cool that way. So, but I also had to have a visual observer because I was watching the screen and rotating the drone. So although it flew along the same flight path, I'd manually control the, the angle of it. So that was kind of the cool part of the planning. Um, the flight went pretty well, so it was getting a little bit far away, hard to see the drone at that distance. But uh, that's why we stopped it just a little early. And then uh, lessons learned. So this ended up being like a six and a half minute video. So this was uh, ended up being way too long. Um, I think a better product would have been just even a slideshow like I'm showing you right now. Because uh, for six and a half minutes, you like even I ended up getting getting bored after the first minute because a lot of the time you're not looking at anything uh, any construction it just looks the same so so kind of knowing what the end product should be and then this is the one that i'm really that i was excited about too this is the um like i mentioned earlier this is kind of why i got into, into interested in drones in the first place just um use, using it for actual survey work and and design work if we could so this is was a actually a um, it was a a playground and a and a parking lot project. So um, <clears throat> right where that bend is, you can see on the east side of the road. That's where a parking lot came off. 
And then there was a little playground just to the south of that. And this was a perfect drone project because there's no vegetation there too. So we thought we had a good shot at maybe um, just shooting the curb line and the tie points. And then we were maybe going to use the grading, um, use, the, use the vertical for, for the grading. And then uh, use the ortho mosaic as well for like the neighboring line work, just to draw in curb and stuff so people could get a reference, but really not have to design to it. Um, but what you're seeing is the left one is the ortho mosaic, and then the right one is a DEM file that, that was created to go along with it. So um, nothing really complex about the planning or the flight. So obviously we're flying over a road, but luckily it's not traveled very, very often. And the way that the flight lined up, um, it flew on each side of the road. And so we only had a crossing on the south. And uh, lessons learned. So th there's this tree, there was this tree right at the bottom there. And I set the flight for hundred feet. And that tree, as it was, as the drone was flying autonomously, I was watching it in regards to that tree. And uh, it actually looked like it was getting pretty close to it when it went over it. Um, so maybe, so it would have just probably saved me some stress about just take the drone and go fly over there, uh, kind of measure it first beforehand how tall it was, instead of uh, just kind of letting it fly uh, without really having control, with having to take um, over the control or the autonomous mission if it was, if it did get too close. So. And here's some more uh, snippets of this. So um, this was the this was the one where we had about the seven to, or yeah five to fourteen hundredths of a foot in accuracy. So this was we used ground control points. We used about twelve of them to set it out. So and then we did so we used twelve when we with the software to have the software tied to our um, control points or to our coordinate system. And then we used twelve to check it. And then um, when this once we got the once we got it processed the way we wanted, we were actually really happy with the horizontal, but the vertical wasn't that great. So we had to go out and do a um, a topo survey to collect, collect all the vertical stuff too. And the project was kind of um, getting towards like some deadlines, so we just wanted to finish um, traditionally, and we thought it would be a really good uh, test for kind of the accuracy what we were seeing with the vertical and horizontal stuff. So so here's the horizontal look, a little bit zoomed in. Um, Here's the vertical, the DEM. So we could have measured that stockpile there, for example. Um, but it just, uh, we, we, so basically the, the horizontal, we, we kind of uh, figured would be maybe close enough for, for construction type work, but uh, the vertical uh, wouldn't be so. And here's a really interesting um, um, little snip of that same map too. So this was down at a point on the on the south end of that, not really a part of that project, but this was a different project too that we surveyed kind of in conjunction with that other project. So, but as you can see here, so the points themselves are lining up really well with the back of curb and front of curb. And um, you can see in this area on the left side of the picture, um, my curve is actually, since I was using line codes when I brought up the survey in, uh, the software didn't actually depict the, the line work where it was supposed to be. So you can tell that through the image, um, even though the points, the, the, the image actually has maybe better horizontal data through there. So I know there's some surveyors out there that probably are laughing because they know that I just missed a PC or something or a little, a small tangent in there with my survey work, but it was a good check. It's a good um, representation of what, uh, how, of how this drone data can be supplemental data. And so just imagine like if you wanted to really like track all those plantings that are in there too. Um, and if you wanted to maybe remove a couple of those and you wanted to know exactly which ones to remove, you had a landscaping crew or a removals crew coming in before. Um, I don't know, the, the construction crew, and so you could have, you know exactly which ones had to be removed. But that, that range of horizontal accuracy, I think would be close enough to get you to uh, an individual plant. So you'd be able to individually stake those out. So also you're getting the silt fence in there, which is more of a temporary thing. And um, the, uh, some of this kind of garbage over there too. So, so this is another, another area of it where we collected a lot more data, where it was good supplemental data, we thought. So here we get all these pipes. We notice all these here. I think something that wouldn't necessarily be uh, collected in the field just because of the temporary nature of it. Um, but also I talked about like the seventh, the about yeah, six to fourteen hundredths type error. 
And so I think it might even be better than that relatively. So that was um, after we processed it and then compared to our GPS points. So I think um, if you're just doing closer distances and you measure maybe like if you're trying to pick quant, you could maybe quantify what size and length of pipe that is just from it. So we, had, we didn't do any really testing to know uh, how accurate we could get that. So we're not 100% sure about that. But um, also some of these trees, um, if you're a surveyor, you know that that sucks to shoot trees like that if you're, you got your GPS out because uh, you might need to get your 12 stations out if you want a really accurate shot where uh, using the image, you can get pretty good idea. This one's a huge tree, so it was hard to see where the trunk was, but I still did just use the aerial image to, to drop the trees in. And these ones I did too. So these are just symbols that I put in there just with the, with the 2D uh, orthomosaic data to help finish out our survey. So then uh, the last project I'm talking about here is a stockpile measurement project. So this was one that's pretty exciting probably for most people if you're in operations or if you're uh, do, involved in maintenance because um, I talked about that vertical uh, ac accuracy not being as good, but that's kind of was through like a lensing thing. So on the outer edges of the project, it was the worst. Um, and in the middle, it was actually pretty good, but it, it, it kind of developed over a, a longer spread of area. So what, what I did with this was we flew it, we got the data, we imported it into Civil 3D. And then I this line right here around the outside of that big pile on the top, um, that is actually what I used for the base elevations. So I was able to sample those elevations along that line and then create a flat plane under the stockpiles. And then I was able to um, measure the stockpiles by comparing the two surfaces. So and we were able to come up with a pretty, pretty accurate number. And, for me, even I would I would be pretty surprised if this didn't end up being more accurate than a uh, a traditional survey. Because for me to go out there with a GPS or total station and try to take sixty or fifty shots and represent you know this this pile with all those deviations in there, I feel like it would be uh, less accurate that way than if we were to use something that can that can pick up all of those small things, even though there might be some deviations in overall and how it's how it, how it's done. So um, this was a, a pretty easy one. So there, were, there really wasn't any people to that. I'd say this was the easiest flight because we knew no people were going to be around. But we used the autonomous mapping part of it. And then we decided to do a um, uh, submit our, um, get authorization from the FAA to fly there too, because we were within five miles from the airport again. So, but uh, the lessons learned is we think that this is pretty viable for, for um, at least small stockpiles like this for measuring the quantities. And this was actually faster and easier than, than the alternative, which is surveying. So this is kind of the, the one thing that's a direct replacement for you know a survey that we've been doing in the past. So, so with that, I'll turn it over to John. Okay. So what were the obstacles and unforeseen complications that we've run into? Um, start with cost. Um, as I said before, uh, Drones can run from under $100 up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you do need to know, you know, what you need the drone to do. I and mean, Nick has been talking about some of the, some of the restrictions and some of the, the issues with the drone specifically, and, and you can spend more money if you want. Now, I think for our, for our purposes, we spent between four and $5,000 total for the drone. And it's not just the drone, it's the drone, it's, it's batteries, it's cases, it's, it's memory cards, it's, um, you know, whatever you need to be able to, um, uh, to do this. We wanted to make sure we had enough money to do it at least the correct way. Um, and you can always spend more. Um, the planned obsolescence is kind of a, a good example of that too, because the minute you receive your drone, there's something better out there. It, it, it's just the way these things work, um, and and the uh, uh, the the rules are changing. You know, based on size of drones and things like that. That that Nick has talked about. So, from our standpoint, we're looking at a three-year replacement on the drone. So, when we get to three years, we'll either have added another drone or we'll replace this one, just so that we know that it will stay um, safe and and it'll work as it's supposed to. Um, the rules and regulations, when and where you can fly. Um, 
you know, the, Nick needs, to, Nick is the one that when he's flying that, that I, I depend on to know, you know, what, what is, what is, uh, where he needs to be and where he, where he can't go. And again, it takes somebody that knows that information, uh, because it's one of the places that you can, you can get in trouble with. Um, the reality of flight time and data demands, as Nick said, our drone gets about 30 minutes on a battery. We've got four batteries. So we've got a total of about two hours flight time, which would end up being, it would take us most of a day to fly that total two hours. Um, so depending on what you want to do, you have to understand that there is that restriction. You can't just fly without limits that way. And then the data demands, these cameras, the pictures that they take uh, create huge files. And if you're taking videos, they're even larger. So uh, you have to you have to manage that um, and make sure that you know how to handle those files. And if you're going to transfer those files to someone, um, how you're going to um, be able to move them? They're not easy to to email around, so um, just be aware of that. Post processing, Nick talked a little bit about it, and really, it's a decision at that point. Um, do you go with something like we've done? Go with an open source pro program because it you know you can get it for free. But there, it, it, there's there's less support for it, and you find you're spending a lot of time trying to chase down uh, accuracy issues, uh, or do you go with a a service? Um, those can get expensive. It it, it kind of depends. You just have to know which direction you want to go with it. Uh, the risk of something happening. One of the first things that we also had to do uh, was to make sure that the city's insurance covered drone operations. And we're, you know, we talked with the League of Minnesota Cities and they said that we were. So we still worry about, you know, um, something, you, you have to worry about what could happen. Um, you know, if you crash or um, the drone flies away, the, the one of the current, con, current concerns about drone operations is somebody taking over your drone and flying away with it. Um, I think they're all pretty low risks as long as you, as long as you take care, but you just, you do need to think about it a little bit. Uh, the environmental restrictions, Nick talked about uh, the temperature and, but you know, it's whether it's temperature or um, too hot or too, or too hot, too cold, uh, raining, uh, whatever else, there there are environmental conditions that will restrict you. So our flying season right now is essentially from April to maybe the first of November, with a little bit in between there as well. Um, also, the number of people who are concerned. Um, I have a number of friends who are well-educated, reasonable people who are concerned about drones, and it really comes back to the the, the privacy issue. Um, you, you, you know, if you're flying over uh, residential properties, any place, uh, you have people that are concerned about what you're doing. So one of the things that we make sure that we do is whatever data we're collecting is available to anybody that would ever request it. Um, kind of following up with that is the number of people who will complain. We have not had an issue at this point, but there are people who will chase down a drone operator and demand that they stop flying. Um, I think the only thing you just need to be aware of it. And for us, as part of our policy, we provide direction to Nick as far as what he needs to do there. And it's really just, you know, land the drone and call police if he needs to. Um, but it is something that happens. Um, the interest in other departments, we had the drone in, in the office for maybe five minutes before the police department showed up and said, we're interested in your drone and your pilot. Um, we've, we've made it a part of our policy that whether it be one of the other departments in the city or uh, one of our neighboring cities, or like in Nick's example, the Rice Creek Watershed District, if somebody has a need, we're willing to work with them and, and use them for that as well. So others will, uh, pretty much every other department in the city has asked us for something at this point. And so you can kind of assume that will be the case for you too. Uh, developing a policy or policies. We started off with a draft policy, again, before we received the drone uh, for engineering. And what we found is that that draft policy was a little too restrictive uh, in terms of um, what we wanted to do. So we have now, we're on our second draft. And then, as I said, the city manager started a, an umbrella 
uh, policy that covers whether it be us engineering and police and whoever else might be flying a drone. Um, it, it takes a fair amount of effort. And I, I think if there's a recommendation is you make it a flexible policy that you can change as you learn more about what you're trying to do. Uh, the changing regulations. So since we bought the drone, FAA has changed the regulations for drone operations pretty significantly. Um, and you need to have someone like Nick who's following that and knows what those, what those regulations and those changes are. And the last one is the staff demands. Um, if I've got Nick out flying, he's not working on a set of plans for me. Um, so you, you need, there is a balance there and you do, you do have to figure out how that's gonna work out. Uh, we certainly could fly more than we are, but uh, we also have other things that need to get done too. Uh, next slide then, Nick. Uh, so where do we see this going? Um, I just said up. Um, I see a need for more or for additional drones and supplies. So again, Nick talked about that there are smaller drones that do what these can and they can do more. Um, I'm sure that we'll have another drone within the next year or so uh, and keep getting more you know, additional batteries and whatever else we need just to kind of keep this going. Um, possibly more pilots. Now, I don't see that we would go out and hire someone just as a pilot, but if I'm interviewing uh, a new engineer and he happens to be a licensed pilot, it certainly is a plus and something I would look for. Um, additional uses. Uh, one of the big things that drones are used for now is in the agricultural area, uh, using a determined vegetative indices. So, you know, we don't have crops growing in the city, but we do have a number of parks and we've got a lot of areas that we are um, irrigating. And I could see us maybe doing something like that to help our um, park department determine whether they're irrigating too much or not enough and maybe help them with that. Um, but what these drones are can do and will do is, is changing every day. So, you know, we'll, we'll continue to see what those changes are and whether they're uh, something we can do. Now, public works specifically, uh, we'd like to work it into more detailed compliance inspection. Now, that's one of the areas where our existing um, policy was overly restrictive, made it a little bit difficult, but we'd like to be able to use it so we can look at these larger sites and have a record of how these, how the contractors are doing and then identify areas where we need to go take a closer look at it. Uh, mapping changes in resources. So we've got, you know, a number of lakes and rivers and ponds and things. Um, and we are responsible in some of these cases for dredging once they fill up with sediment. Um, and, you know, I can see us uh, at least on the major water bodies going out and flying them on an annual basis, just so we can see the changes on them. Um, Inspection of hard to reach uh, structures. Now, Nick's example of the water tower is a perfect example there. Uh, there's others as well. But uh, in Fridley, we have, a, uh, along the Mississippi River, we have a number of outfalls that we're required to inspect on an annual basis. Um, they're not only difficult to get to, but they're also dangerous to get to. So uh, we're, we're working on using the drone to be able to do some of those inspections. Now we do have a line of sight issue with that we're working on, but I think that we will eventually be able to do that as well. Um, again, back to the, the, the additional sensors that will be available. There are drones that have LIDAR available to them. Um, I don't, think on this level of drone, but at some point I believe it will be available and you'll be able to create 2D and 3D digital maps that you'll be able to scale things off of. And I, you know, if that's available for our type of drone, we would certainly look at that. Um, traffic counts. I know there are people who use drones for flying over an intersection and counting cars. I don't know that that's something that we would do. I think we kind of rely on our consultants for most of that, but it is possible. Uh, pre and post project photos and videos. Um, we do uh, infrastructure projects every year, uh, anywhere from one to three projects a year. And before we start these projects, we have historically had a video camera and driven down the street and took a video of, of everything. Uh, we're talking about changing that to use these drones. I think the cameras are a little better and we can fly the exact same uh, flight up and down these streets and look at it. Now there's some issues with doing that. We're working through that as well. Um, but I, I believe we will be doing that. 
Um, you know, as the additional sensors are um, available, we'll, we'll take a look at them and we'd certainly use them if they're valued to us. Uh, collaborative photography for presentations. I think that's the main interest of other departments is they, they need a picture of something. They need a nice picture that is going to help their presentation. So uh, we'll continue to do that. Now, um, again, we are willing to do that for whether it be another department in the city or one of our partners, you know, whether it be a watershed district or a, uh, another city, we're willing to do that. And then just seeing things from a different perspective, it does give you a, a different way of looking at things that you normally do. So in conclusion, um, you know, it's hard not to get swept up into drones. They're fascinating, they're fun and very interesting. Uh, they're here and they'll continue to improve and do more. Uh, it's it's as hard to imagine what we'll be using drones for in the future as it was 10 years ago to see what we're using them for now. Uh, by all accounts, there'll be commercial drones regularly or all around us soon. Uh, this will drive the technology and what they'll do going further. So with that, uh, that is the end of our presentation. If you have any questions, we've got time to talk. Um, and Nick and I are, that's our contact information. If you'd like to call either one of us or email either one of us, if you've got something you have a question about after the presentation, feel free to do that. We do have a question in chat from John. He says, we have a long water pipeline that crosses mostly rural areas and some very difficult areas to access on foot. We would like to be able to check the route for leaks or maintenance needs. Is it possible to be licensed to fly the pipeline route without line of sight to the drone? Yeah, I can take that one, I guess. So it is possible. So, we, so almost with all of those rules set forth by the FAA, there is, um, you can get waivers is what they're called. So um, I haven't I haven't done an official waiver process, but I think but you can submit it. There's an official process on um, going beyond visual line of sight. It's going to be really hard to do because I don't. Um, I think it takes a lot of. Um, they, they're, what their concerns are that they want you to satisfy is going to require a lot more than just having a drone. It's going to require probably different transmission setups with like multiple things that you can't get in a commercial drone. So that would be I think it'd be hard to do, but. It's possible, but hard. Yeah, as far as being able to see it, I think you'd be able to see it pretty, pretty well too, because you can always um, edit your resolution by just flying lower, so. You might be able to see the valves and things like that. Yeah, and thanks, Perry, for the comment. It's a nice comment. So Claire, do you uh, know if it's gonna be made, uh, if they can access this somewhere? Yes, we, so we, we are recording this presentation and it will be made available to watch on the LTAP website. Um, I'm not sure what a COA is exactly. Um, probably, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we haven't, we haven't got, we haven't gone through that process to get any. And if you'd like a copy of the slides, uh, just 
um, why don't you send Nick an email and he'll be happy to uh, send that uh, our presentation to you as well. Um, so the one about the easement for utilities give you permission to access private property via a drone. So that's the interesting thing that I think is a misconception between a lot of property owners is that they think that they kind of own the airspace above the property, but that's really not the case. The FAA regulates um, all the airspace above a property. So you would have to check with the FAA about airspace regulations in the specific area. So in the and the property owners won't really have a lot of uh, a lot of say in whether or not you can fly it over there. But I, I think a lot of people, uh, when you're a drone operator, you, you look for um, getting permission first, because like I said, the, there's kind of the misconception that people think they own airspace above their property. So they might come out and that might save you uh, a confrontation out there where someone's feeling like they're being cheated. Yeah, and Jim, looks like Jim from our Public Works Department submitted uh, a link about the COA, Certificate of Waiver Authorization. But yeah, that's interesting. Looks like some of the attendees are dropping off. Do you want to stick around for a couple more minutes for any other remaining questions or? We, we certainly can stay here for a couple more minutes. Um, okay. But you know, as we said before, if you've got questions afterwards, feel free to email either, either Nick or myself and we'll get an answer back to you right away. Yeah, now that COA, I do remember that because our, 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 our police department wanted us to try to get one for flying at night. But I think there was only, I looked at the list of online that have lists of who, who all has gotten them. And there wasn't a lot that, um, there wasn't a lot of them out for flying at night. So
Okay, well, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. So I think maybe we should close now. Okay. But thank you so much, Nick and John. That was an amazing presentation. And thank you everyone for attending. Yeah, thanks. Yep, thank you, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.